All around the world are unique landscapes, each with their own distinct history. Today, we journey to Big South Fork, a land of hidden treasures, colorful forests, and towering bluffs, to share in the grandeur of one of Tennessee's special places. Early autumn, we were off once again, this time with our sights set to the south. We passed through Cincinnati and then across the border into Kentucky. As we drove, the city landscapes eventually gave way to dense foliage, just beginning to show the signs of the changing season. We drove through open, rural farmland, where we saw some grazing horses. Then, we entered a region with more natural, forested hills. Now, we had arrived at our destination, Big South Fork National Park. We got our gear together and reviewed our plans at the trailhead. We would be taking the Fall Branch Trail east and camping on our way to the Angel Falls Overlook. On our way back, we would camp another night and then take the northern end of the Lytton Slavins Loop Trail. The trail immediately took us into the woods, where the feeling of autumn was all around. I love the smell of the smoke and the crunching of the leaves underneath my feet. It's definitely beginning to be fall. Then the trail emptied out onto a road, where it interestingly enough took us by a volleyball field and a campground. Then we arrived at a second trailhead where the journey truly began. The weather was crisp and cool, and the forest around us felt open and welcoming. Do you guys think this is actually clearer than like some of the forests in Ohio we've been in? Or is it just that it's nice and cool and comfortable and so it almost looks clearer to us? <laughs> well, I would say the weather definitely makes a difference. You're like, oh man, this is so nice and clear. Yeah, actually the reason a lot of places we've been to are overgrown with shrubs it's because they do logging, which then lets in a lot of sunlight and causes undergrowth to grow higher than it would normally. As we continued on, we saw some wintergreen berries, and Brian spotted a colorful mushroom. Okay, so we have some orange, yellowish mushrooms over here, which could be chanterelles. They don't look like the typical jack-o'-lanterns, which are what people will mistake them for. Whoa! Uh, I don't think so, but that is colorful. Let's go check it out. The color and the fact that they have real gills makes me want to say jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, but I've never seen them ever get this big. They don't usually get that shape either. Yeah, so those are jack-o'-lantern mushrooms. And I'm not 100% sure if this is the case, but I think they're called jack-o'-lantern mushrooms not just because of their really bright orange color, but because at night they have a slight bioluminescence so they can glow in the dark. The trail now brought us deeper into a ravine. Here, we saw some rattlesnake plantain growing out of old rotting wood. Then we came upon some ladders, helpfully constructed for hikers to navigate around the rocky terrain.
More sandstone bluffs surrounded us at every turn, and the trail took us underneath some of the rocky overhangs. <laughs> the sandstone boulders were reminiscent of other places we had explored, like Hawking Hills or Red River Gorge. But there were so many of them around us, with vegetation growing from the nooks and crannies. As we hiked along, Andrew saw some interesting patterns in the rocks. I keep seeing all these spherical shaped divots in the rocks, and I imagine those are little concretions that fell out of the rock. Like you can clearly see the different striations and different layers of sediment in this sandstone, but there's probably these deposits of like concretions in between the layers. Um, and sometimes those contain fossils on the inside. People theorize that those form when like an animal died back when this was all ocean and started tumbling around and building up sediment around it, but they're unnatural looking almost because they're like very perfect rock spheres. Water dripped down from the mossy stones above as we continued exploring this intriguing landscape. Now, the trail took us deeper into the forest. It's been a while since I've seen this tree, but this is actually one of my favorite trees. I keep seeing these oxalis trees or tree sorrel. And it gets that name because the leaf tastes like any other sorrel plant. It's got this nice tangy sour taste. And one way to identify it, because it is a very generic looking leaf, but on the underside along the central ridge, there's tiny little spines that kind of come off of it. But yeah, you can just eat it whole like a salad. Good stuff. Up ahead, we saw another wild edible, a partridge berry. As the evening set in, we started keeping a lookout for any campsite we could use. Is there a firing? I feel like there's a firing. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see one. Okay. It doesn't look like this is a well-traveled path, but I can tell it's been traveled, I think. I mean, I'm not an expert tracker, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was dark already, we could definitely stay here. Yeah. What time is it anyway? Let's see. Six. So we got about an hour of light. In that case, I say we just start booking it and get to a good campsite. All right. I guess we have this to fall back to if we really yeah. need to, though. The tops of the hills were still soaked in sunlight, so we decided to keep hiking. On the ground beneath us were an array of unique-looking, recently fallen leaves. These are magnolia leaves. And it's so striking to see them on the ground because one, they're huge, but two, once they've died, they just become this bleached white on the underside. I came expecting to find like Chinese or Japanese calligraphy written on one of these or something. <laughs> it's really cool. As soon as you get out of the forest, it's still quite daylight outside. It's interesting we were just in an area of the forest that was like a little more sparse. It looks like there were some pine trees that died off and some new saplings growing up. Now we're back into the thick of it though. And it's often in the thick of the woods where you find the finest treasures. Brian is always the one who spots these sorts of things, but come check this out. First, let me direct your attention to the right where we have some nice puff balls. However, I think, oh no, these are perfect. So these are pear-shaped puff balls and if they are completely white on the inside, that means they are good to eat. This tree is just covered in them. They're like little little things you can just pop your mouth. I mean, you gotta cook them first, but. So yeah, completely edible. If they're green on the inside, that means they're already starting to age and you shouldn't eat them. But over here, this is a really, really bright orange looking chicken of the woods. This is one of the most vibrant chicken of the woods I've seen, I think. Chicken of the woods will sometimes grow out of like pine trees, sometimes it'll grow out of hardwood. There are some people who say if it's growing from a pine tree, it's not as good to eat. This one is a little bit older and crustier, would probably be still good to eat if you cut certain parts off of it, but it looks just so beautiful. Again, perfect Halloween colors. I decided to leave the chicken alone and instead collect some puffballs to liven up my dinner tonight. 
While I foraged, Brian went on ahead. So Brian went ahead to scout for campsites. And with any luck, we're gonna get to him and he's got a campsite. That's like the best feeling in the world. <laughs> Hardly ever happens, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Oh, we got a whoop from Brian. It is flattening out here a little bit. Maybe. Oh, I'm feeling good. Oh yeah, it looks open up there. Tell me you got a campsite. Yes! Oh, yes. Seems like it'll work for our needs. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Wow. I. <laughs> Did you hear what we were saying? I didn't hear. I was like, man, with any luck, you'll have a campsite and we'll just walk up to you and be like, welcome. <laughs> This is definitely an A tier, you know, with the bell curve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking I might put my pack down and go walk a little further just because it's flattening out. It looks like it almost opened up or something. Yeah, but I don't and know just if see I'm if there's it. anything better. But oh. I just took this. I just walked in here to check it out and see if it was a campsite. And then I heard you guys, so I was like, "Yeah, I'll wait until you show up." Yeah, let's take a look through here. See if it's more open. Uh, this, I think this looks better, do you? I'm not sure. My, my main concern is where I can set a hammock up, so that's what I'm looking at. Oh. Hmm. I mean, <clears throat> this looks like a whole commune. I don't know, what'd you think? This one has a better fire area. It's definitely a bit more open with flatter, with softer flat ground. Yeah, this is definitely better for hammocks too. You got two trees right here. Yeah, I can hammock right here. Yeah. I'm thinking we could just camp here and then cook our food and eat over on the other site. Yeah. Sounds great. And that way we don't have to move our packs right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna go set up a hammock. <laughs> Does anyone want some of this before I get my hands in it more? No, no look at mine. <laughs> Jesus, guys. <laughs> no, I've got a lot of food too, actually. <laughs> Calorie-wise, I think I got enough for like a week. <laughs> we sat around enjoying some snacks before moving to the other site to set up camp. I was going to be sleeping under the tarp tonight and was brushing away leaves on the ground to avoid any ticks or other bugs that might crawl on me. In the meantime, I set up my tent and Brian hoisted up his hammock. Tonight's weather would be perfect for sleeping out in the open air. Campsite's looking pretty good, I think. Yeah, this is great. I'm liking this setup a lot. Nice open ground. Hopefully it won't be too cold. After setting up camp, we went back to the other campsite to cook a more real meal. As we boiled our water over the stove, we heard the call of animals in the distance. Sounds like coyotes. I can't believe that we walked up and you actually had a campsite. That was so great. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I don't think we would have missed any of these. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> but I feel like it's that little burst of morale where you're like, oh, he does have something. <laughs> it's like when you think somebody has a gift for you, and then it turns out they actually do, and you're like, yeah! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like a perfect night right now. Nice pine forest, nice cool weather. Man, I am hungry too. Neither me or Brian ate until like an hour ago, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of sandwich is it? <laughs> Turkey and Monster juice with mayo. Oh, Monster is good. <laughs> it's a Monster mash. It's <laughs> good for Halloween. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <-y. laughs> While Brian enjoyed his sandwich, I prepped some dehydrated spaghetti. And I was attempting to prepare microwavable instant mac in the wild, along with some ramen. Got my mid level manager ramen. <laughs> <laughs> then I remembered I had something that would make the meal a little bit more exciting. So I almost forgot I was going to add these beautiful puff balls to my noodles. I'm going to tear each one open just to make sure it's uh, you know, fresh inside and then add it in. Now it was just a matter of boiling the puff balls to make sure they were cooked through. My spaghetti was now cooked and Andrew was putting the finishing touches on his instant mac. 
Is this don't coming? miss. Don't miss. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be real bad. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see if uh, this would work without a microwave. And when you're out here, <laughs> you've got to live off the land. <laughs> This actually smells really good. This is the, the Asian flavor. <laughs> is that actually what it says? Well, it says soy sauce, but I, it used to say oriental. Same oriental flavor. <laughs> yeah, it used to say oriental flavor. <laughs> to finish things off, I added the puff balls to the ramen. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> this is like if uh, cereal and milk was salty instead of sweet. That's what it looks like. <laughs> like soggy shell-shaped cereal and milk. Those are real food. <laughs> it's great. It might be because I'm just craving food that isn't dried fruit, <laughs> but this is actually pretty good. <laughs> I love mac and cheese. Now for the top ramen. Wow, this is good, man. This is like a, basically a step up from school spaghetti. Mm. These pupples are like, they kind of like pop in your mouth mm. when you bite in them. Almost that snap of a hot dog kind of because it's got the outer layer. Oh yeah. I've always kind of likened puff balls to like a spongy bread. Mm. They kind of like absorb with the flavor of whatever you cook them in. Mm -hmm. In this case, oriental. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Your guys' sheer satisfaction brings me satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> After a satisfying meal, we stored our food and strolled back to our campsite, where we would settle in for the rest of the night. All right, it's gotten much colder, but right now I'm feeling pretty cozy inside of this tarp. Got my nice down jacket, some long pants. It's gonna be a good night. And I love sleeping out in the open, brisk fall air. It's good times. How's the hammock, Brian? Good. Getting comfortable. Okay, well, good night. dawn air was brisk, and it motivated me to get up and make our campsite a bit more comfortable. So the others are still sleeping, and I'm collecting some firewood to start a nice morning fire because it was a little bit chilly last night, but I think a fire is going to be much appreciated this morning, and I have a new tool to help with that. And for the kids watching, this is not a toy, but it's gonna help me chop some big pieces of wood. One thing to keep in mind when you're chopping is to make sure that if your blade doesn't hit the wood and it passes through, that you're not gonna hit your leg. So you wanna have probably one leg back as you're swinging this around. Right, this is a rotten piece of wood anyway, so let's find a better one to chop. So as I was cutting these, I noticed there's some pretty good looking fat wood where these knots are with these branches coming out. So I'm gonna take some of these off and I'll find that one later. There you go. You can see how red and resinous that is. So that'll be perfect for starting a fire. 
Full disclosure, I only brought a lighter today, so it's not even gonna be that hard to start, but. So this huge knife is called a kukri, and kukris are traditionally used by Nepalese people and Nepalese soldiers, but kukris usually come with two smaller knives, and this one is called a chakmak, which is basically a blunt knife uh, meant to be used like a butcher steel to hone the blade. This one, it actually has an edge on it, and I'm gonna use that to kinda feather these fat woods a little bit. This karta is handy for finer woodwork that the kukri might not be suited for. Now it was time to start the fire. I was taking it easy with a lighter this time around, but it was still a bit of a challenge with this tiny piece of fat go. wood that I was using. with like a few millimeters of tinder, it's so much easier with a lighter. <laughs> the fire was burning strong, and it was a welcome sight on a morning as brisk as this one. morning carried on, and with the fire started, it was time to maintain my kukri. So one thing you can do with this chakmak is, my blade has a bunch of like sap and wood residue on it, and you can use it to clean it off to maintain the blade. Because unlike stainless steel, this can stain and rust. It's a good way to maintain it in the field. Also, after chopping, you can hone your blade by sticking the knife in the wood like this, running it down like that. This old pine stump in it has a bunch of fat wood, but fat wood is just when old pine wood has like a bunch of the pine resin collected in one area. And that stuff, one, preserves the wood pretty well, but also is really flammable. So if you ever see this at a campsite, it's, it's a great thing to collect and take with you. I grabbed the food as Andrew maintained his knife. It was time to boil some water for breakfast. The forest was peaceful and quiet all around us. It's always nice to have time to kill on calm mornings like this one. Eventually, I got up and joined the others around the campfire. Did you guys sleep? I slept 11 hours, I counted. <laughs> How long did you sleep? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you slept for... Half a day, I think. <laughs> like I said, I was super exhausted the whole day yesterday. Like, the nap I took in the car never really did it for me. Yeah. So I was, like, just cold enough. It wasn't unbearable or anything like that. Like, it was actually pretty comfortable, but I just kept waking up, like, I think every hour or something. Oh, I did wake up once. And I actually woke up in the middle of the night because it was too hot. Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> I was, like, sweating. I was, like, mm. I started unzipping <laughs> things. <laughs> when I first got into my sleeping bag, I was, like, oh, you, I could probably take off my clothes. And I was, like, mm, let's leave them on. Yeah, the definitely best got... De best decision. <laughs> definitely got cooler as the night went on. So our viewer, Kaylin, she sent us a bunch of dehydrated meals. This one is called Citrus Chia Morning. And sadly, it says it feeds one. So... I won't be sharing, sorry guys. <laughs> okay, so this is banana citrus infused chia seed pudding with pineapple, kiwi, coconut flakes, and vanilla. Okay. As Robbie's meal cooked, I poured the rest of the water into my cup to enjoy straight up. Now, it was time to taste my breakfast. Mmm. <laughs> Delicious. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we milled around camp a bit longer before packing up our shelters and breaking camp.
And of course, we always make sure to leave no trace at our campsites. We hoisted up our backpacks and headed back out on the trail. Just past the campsite, the trail took us down a hill, where we were again in the thick of the woods. Just off the trail, we saw more rocky overhangs and bluffs. In one area, we saw signs of a previous campsite, though it's best not to camp near these rock walls to prevent any damage to the natural environment. Yeah, you definitely shouldn't camp here, but that would be a fun campsite. <laughs> There's also some striped wintergreen growing here. Nice. The mossy rocks trickled with water droplets. As we hiked, we especially appreciated the cool fall air all around us. This is absolutely idyllic weather, and the feeling of the temperature and the greenery of the rhododendrons, even the sounds, like it all transports me back to the first few trips we did to Shenandoah and the Smokies. And I feel like this is like, if I think of a camping trip, this is, you know, what I would picture in my head. So good to be here. <laughs> Up ahead, we spotted Ligodium palmatum, the American climbing fern. So these are a type of fern. Because they're a fern, they're an angiosperm, which means they procreate by spreading spores, basically. They don't have any fruits or seeds like that. Um, but they're really unique looking. You know, we see kind of two different leaves here. I think this is actually the same plant, and these are like the fertile fronds of this. And if you look really closely, you can see that there's little pockets of spores. So these big ones themselves are, are just for like photosynthesis and stuff, and then the little ones spread the actual spores. Further on, Brian again spotted some intriguing mushrooms. All right, this looks like a puffball of some sort to me. The texture looks like it's maybe a poison pigskin puffball, but let's open it up. Oh, yep. So see how it's all black inside? This is a poison pigskin puffball. And that's why it's important to check inside uh, the puffballs before you eat them, because this one, as the name implies, is perfectly edible. <laughs> no, it's poisonous. <laughs> we now entered a section of the forest dotted with fallen magnolia leaves and flanked by intricate rock formations. Different types of moss and lichen grew from the sandstone, and partridge berry vines dangled off of their rough edges. Just off the trail was a path leading to the Fall Branch Falls. The path led straight to a stream feeding into the falls, so we decided to fill up on water. And this time, we had finally given our water filter proper maintenance. Yeah, this is, this is maximally lubed. <laughs> the falls trickled off of a sandstone ledge and the colorful autumn leaves were contrasted by the cool, dark waters. Now, it was back onto the main trail. The sun was now high in the sky, shining through the ferns and the leaves above. Thank you.
Now, we entered a section of the woods with more pine amid the hardwood trees. Whenever we're in an area like this, it feels like we've entered the home of some forest spirit. Because the ground is just covered in this like carpet of pine needles. It, it feels like someone laid out a welcome mat or something. <laughs> Along with the needles on the ground below, some of them were dangling from the shrubs, like little ornaments. We entered a section of the forest where several tall pine trees had died, leaving their barren trunks towering high above into the open sky. It was a little bit strange, as it almost looked like power line poles had been stuck in the ground here. The path now took us back down into a flatter, more open area. I feel like this would be a campsite area. Do you see anything up there? It does look flat up here, but I don't see any opening. I feel like the next campsite we see, we should stop and have lunch. Or at least, I will. <laughs> Speaking of lunch, I spotted a small edible mushroom nearby. So these mushrooms sticking out of this log is a type of chanterelle. They're a lot smaller than the usual chanterelles you think of when you think of the kinds you might find at a store or in a restaurant. And they have this almost like I call it like almost a translucent, waxy kind of look. But one way you know it's a chanterelle is if you look under the underside, they don't have true gills like other mushrooms would. They have the same ridges that you find on all chanterelles. A bridge took us across a ravine where we came upon a trail junction. We were making progress on our hike. So the John Lytton Farm is the loop we're on. And we're gonna go this way to the Grand Gap Loop which heads toward Angel Falls. Yeah, and tomorrow we'll be going back this way. Yeah. Oh, there's another bench over here. Yeah. And it says two miles to the Grand Gap, so that's about what we have to hike, right? So this is where we are, and this is the two mile little intersection we have to get to the Grand Gap Loop, which is right here. And then Angel Falls will be down here. It was going to be a long hike ahead, so we decided to sit and enjoy lunch. I got some of this jerky from one of our viewers, Aquia. I just opened it if you guys want to partake. A little meat fall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's buffalo jerky. Mm, that's good. Savory and spicy. <laughs> Seems to be it's just buffalo and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mm. Aquia. Yeah, it's really good, actually. Wow. The spicy is coming in there at the end a little. What do you guys think of the hike so far? It's like a perfect hike, perfect weather, perfect energy level. I'd have to agree on all three fronts. <laughs> Couldn't ask for much more. Nor would I. Can't tempt the fates like that. <laughs> In the ground nearby grew some Romaria stricta, or upright coral fungus. Now, we continued on. There were more magnolia leaves on the ground, along with some of the prehistoric looking seed pods. This one is kind of Slimy and half rotten, but these are the seed pods of magnolia tree. So do the seeds like come out of the little holes in there? I think so. At some point, I believe there's like a bunch of red seeds all over that. Also, this leaf is very nice and soft. I uh, collect some for, you know, bathroom usage. <laughs> As we hiked, we could see some open spaces just off the trail. Okay, well, there's a campsite right here. So if we can't find any others, we know that at the trail junction, there's a good campsite, so. Ways off though. Yeah. On the ground, I spotted some large distinctive looking leaves. And I know they're not much to look at right now, but I believe these belong to an orchid called lady slippers. We've seen these before up in Algonquin. We've never seen them when they're like fully in bloom, but they look like this really pretty pink or purple flower. And as you might expect, it kind of looks like a slipper you could put your foot in. Up ahead, the trail led us to an impressive recessed cave that towered far above us. We were in awe at the scale of the cave, and we decided to explore some of its dark recesses. Uh, the rocks look really cool. Can you see those like striations? Spooky place to be at night. <laughs> Good place to hide out, though. And 
while the expansiveness of the cave was a sight to behold, the varied textures of the rocks up close were also awe-inspiring. Ripples of rock were highlighted in the soft light of the forest. The path led us further along, where there were even more dark caves set into the rocky walls. And of course, we had to explore them for ourselves. Whoa, this goes kind of deep. Yeah. Well, how deep does it go? It ends about back here. No cave trolls to see us. They crawl in there if you were braver person. <laughs> I would not. That would be a rocky tomb. <laughs> There's a whole thing here too. Oh, oh whoa, yeah. yeah look up. This is where you would sleep. <laughs> uh, you'd sleep with a bear and just hug it for warmth. <laughs> this is probably like a bear den. <laughs> Deep in the cave, the light cast long shadows into the void. For us, it was time to return into the open light. The recessed cave disappeared behind us as we entered into a hardwood forest, where we saw an old tree covered in Ganoderma mushrooms. We passed by another campsite, making a mental note of it before continuing on through the tunnel of trees. The quietness of the late afternoon set in. Andrew saw an interesting plant and a colorful little critter. So many of you may already know, but this plant with the waxy spiky leaves is called holly. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to think this was mistletoe, so I had the two plants switched around. Uh, but yeah, this is obviously associated with the holiday season and Christmas in particular. It's got like nice red berries and green leaves. And in the Christmas spirit, even though it's October, there's a very red creature on one of these leaves called a red velvet mite. It's not a tick, thankfully, although if you didn't know any better, you might think it was. But these are, as far as I know, fairly harmless. And sometimes they're much smaller than that. Uh, sometimes they get as big as this guy over here, though. Nearby was an old milk cat mushroom. We also saw a sign warning of the terrain ahead. Hold on. Huh. That's not how you spell cliff, right? Yeah. Is a cliff different from a... Like the clifty wilderness. What is it? Maybe it's like an alternate spelling or something. Some people, someone like fished it. Yeah. That's when uh, you have a true and false test and you don't know the answer. <laughs> the trail now took us up switchbacks. The sky above was much more overcast and gray than before. As we went higher, we saw different types of lichen growing from the sandy soil in the trees. We found a small overlook and could see some rocky outcrops in the distance peering above an impressive gorge. Hello. It was a beautiful sight to see from here, but now we were going to make our way to that same overlook. And along the way, Brian spotted yet another chicken of the woods. Looks alright, it's a bit old, but uh, 
It's not too bad. Wow, our second chicken of the woods this hike. <laughs> That's kind of kind of crazy. It's rare? Uh, I mean, it's not the most common thing. It's always exciting when you find it, so. There was also a tree covered in crowded parchment fungus. And up ahead, we found a fantastic looking campsite. Oh, yeah, this would probably be really good timing wise and distance wise for a campsite tonight. Yeah. Well, let's go take a look real quick at least first. Perfect hammock spot. <laughs> Hammock here, tent here, tarp there. <laughs> a campsite is always a welcome sight, but for now, we had to keep moving. And only a stone's throw away, we found yet another beautiful campsite right by a stream. Well, we got two campsites, just in case one of these gets taken. We got a backup. Another thought is, if both campsites are open, we can just do what we did last night, which is eat at one and then sleep at the other, which would be perfect. They're both very close walking distance. We're at the junction, there's also a parking lot up there. I believe we'll be turning right. Yeah. Huh. Oh. So yeah, we want to go... You. <laughs> go right to the falls and back. Yeah. Looks like... That's gonna be our view right there. Pretty good view. Now, it was about a mile hike to the Angel Falls Overlook. Along the way, we saw a gem-studded puffball. We also came across a tragic but historic tombstone just off the trail. Archie Smith. Oh, wow, the son of someone. Born May 27th, 1932, died October 22nd, 1932. Oh, man. Wow. Giving thanks for this beautiful day we were experiencing, we continued hiking on what was apparently Tennessee's own John Muir Trail. Out of the campsite, taunting my weary legs. <laughs> We hiked onward along this forested ridge when it suddenly opened up into a rocky outcropping. Ooh. It had been a decent hike from the junction and we were more than happy to sit back and enjoy the view. And as we sat, we ran into Terry, a viewer of the show. But that was basically it, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I told you all the good stuff already. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to come back then and, and yeah. make sure we yeah. do that. It started sprinkling a bit as we got ready to move on. Turns out, Terry told us that you can't actually see the falls, but there's another overlook up ahead that he says is even better than this one. So we're gonna go up at least to that one, check it out and then hopefully get back to the campsite before it starts raining too hard. So what's going on? Looks like we're at a four-way junction. I think the JMT continues this way, but we're going what? Left or forward? This way goes to the overlook. Okay. Yeah. The trail again opened up and we finally arrived at the Angel Falls Overlook. From here, you could see more of the river below and the vast gorge surrounding it. Okay. Just gonna be very careful here. Oh, my lord. Whoa. Yeah, this is definitely way better. It's strange, it's funny because you're literally just over there, but man, it's got this beautiful view. Holy cow. So I guess Angel Falls would be somewhere over there. You can hear it, you can hear it. It's down there. But the rocks too are so colorful. A light rain came down as we enjoyed the beautiful view, along with a sweet treat. Okay, what do you got for us? Okay, so since it is autumn, I have some autumnal pies. <laughs> <laughs> Personal pies. <laughs> and now we got a... The 10 for $10 variety. We have to negotiate for who's... The con. Who's getting the last straw of apple. Oh, you got a chocolate. Oh, well, What's which one, one did you want? Oh, I don't care. Chocolate eclair. 
Oh. Apple pie yeah. and pecan. You Which don't, one did you want? I would like the chocolate one. Like you don't pecan. like pecan, right? I don't like pecan, yeah. Uh, it's pro I'm probably I'll take gonna... apple, you take chocolate, oh, real? and then you take pecan. Right. What? You, you're going to take the apple? Okay. Oh, the apple was the least popular? Oh, in my mind. <laughs> what do you want, Andy? <laughs> yeah, I like pecan. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Oh man. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Dude, that was good. Yeah. I did not expect a crappy dollar store pie <laughs> to taste any good. No regrets. Floor pie. <laughs> mm. Store pie. <laughs> I'd make it a floor pie. <laughs> Here, be, yeah, that's a floor this pie. is exactly like an eclair donut, but just with a pie crust. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is like a cold McDonald's apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the pecan pie. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, right. this is like a pecan pie, but with the right ratio of crust to, to everything mm. else. Mm. <laughs> it is good, but I still wish I could share. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Happy... Happy autumn. <laughs> In the distance, the skies look like they were clearing up. We got one last glimpse of the valley below before making the long trek back to our campsite. Okay, last chance. We don't want to take this, right? Nah. We got this. It's like a mile plus hike, right? As we hiked, the sun started shining through the clouds, making everything gleam and glint. It was a surprisingly long hike, but eventually we neared the junction as the weather continued clearing up. Well, the sun's out and we're almost back. Yeah. I mean, it's not too bad. I'm actually kind of hot, actually, from the rain jacket. Yeah, same. Okay, we're getting real close now, right? Yeah, it seems longer than I remember, though. <laughs> In other good news, the rain has stopped, too. Okay, so that's our eating campsite right there, right? We were a bit nervous that someone might have grabbed the campsite while we were gone. Is it clear? Yep. Awesome. That was a lot of hiking, right? Yeah. It's a decent amount, yeah. I think maybe my mind just went into campsite mode as soon as we came here. <laughs> I've just been waiting for this the whole time. <laughs> Woo! Home sweet home for the night. Now, we unburdened ourselves and settled into camp. Unfortunately, my crappy tent broke once again, and the duct tape I brought served as a quick fix. Welcome to Chateau Lynn, number one. <laughs> and then Chateau Lynn, number two. <laughs> These do look like really nice setups. Chateau Robbie. <laughs> just completely sad and pathetic. Chateau Robbie is just the shed in the back of both of our chateaus. <laughs> So since it rained, I'm gonna be sleeping deeper into the tarp so that I'm not as exposed. But I kinda want it to be a little more roomy, so I'm gonna use a method called the rock button. I don't have a rock, but apparently I have this little dongloid in my backpack. And Brian, if you can help me. So just push it up against the middle of the tarp there. Here? Yeah, that's perfect. I'm gonna try to wrap this around. All right, so now I've got it out here. I'm gonna tie this rope around it. Double knot it for security. <laughs> yeah, 
I don't know why I've never done this before, but I knew about it for a while. The chateau has a new expansion. <laughs> <laughs> We're very uh, ready for camera, and I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we were rain free for now. We went to the other campsite where we boiled some water to cook up food. Tonight, I would be having beef stroganoff. And I would be having some Thai curry noodles, another microwavable meal that I would attempt to cook with boiled water. So I've got from Bushka's Kitchen, unstuffed pepper, which it looked pretty good <laughs> when I poured water in it. Okay, and I've got the classic beef stroganoff. I think that was the first dehydrated meal I ever had, actually. Really? Well, I think Thomas had it, and I watched him eat it. <laughs> Man, that looks this good. looks like something I'd make at home. Just like quinoa, and then it's just a bunch of stuff mixed in, but there's mm. a lot of red peppers in here. Mmm. Ooh, that's good. Mmm. Wow. That's really good. Cheers to that. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, you hungry? <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> Getting a little jealous. <laughs> Dude, a hot meal is vital to the end of the hike. Mm. You can't sleep without a hot meal. You can, but it's a sad sleep. I was again having instant mac tonight. You gotta have the proper cheese squeezing technique. Yeah, yeah get that old. Kinda looks like kicks. <laughs> I don't know how you did it, but you made it look worse than yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just more undercooked now. So this is a Thai coconut curry noodle, and I think you're actually supposed to drain the water. So I'm just gonna drink it. <laughs> mm, noodle water. Dude, this is getting sadder by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, now there's some Thai coconut sauce. Welcome to microwave cooking without the microwave. <laughs> Probably should have drained more of the water, but you know. Surprisingly flavorful. Is it warm even? Warmer than room temperature. <laughs> it's food. We shouldn't have let you do this to yourself. <laughs> As the evening turned to night, the air dropped in temperature. Although much of what was around us was damp, we decided to try and start a fire tonight. We were gonna need to gather extra kindling and dead hemlock branches were perfect just for that. While Andrew collected kindling, Brian gathered up some bigger pieces that would help keep the fire going. There you go. Yeah. After searching around, we found enough big pieces. Now it was time to process it down again with the kukri. So the kukri comes with a small knife for finer work, but in case you're using a large knife without any of that, one thing you can do to shave little feathers off of a stick is stick the knife in a log like this and kind of use it like this and just draw little shavings off of it. It's not gonna get you the most beautiful feather sticks or anything, but especially because I'm using fat wood, this will do the job fine. It was a cinch to get the fire started, with just a few shavings of fat wood and the lighter. fire was much needed after dealing with the dampness of the rain. We all sat around and enjoyed its warm glow and reflected on the day. How are you guys feeling right now? <laughs> Man, after the rain, being able to still have a fire at night is like so comforting. <laughs> feel like a thousand percent better from last night. This is like the ideal conclusion to a, a long day. We even got to our campsite like early enough at time yeah. to... Sometimes being in civilization feels so chaotic, but as long as at the end of the day, you can be with people you like and have a fire and warmth. <laughs> it's like all I need in life. <laughs> it's funny how like comforting it is to have a fire. It just like seals in this place as your home for the night. Somehow a night doesn't feel fully complete if there's no fire. Yeah. 
last night definitely didn't feel completely complete. Yeah. As we were hiking in the rain back from the overlook, I kept thinking like, are we gonna do a fire tonight? And then it would rain a bunch and I'd be like, hmm. <laughs> and then it would let up, I was like, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> so do you guys have any stories that aren't too scary, but would be mm. fun to tell around a campfire? In fact, you know what? We don't even need scary stories, just stories. <laughs> what would you guys used, to, like, what did you used to do as kids for Halloween? I mean, we all did the same things, but what specific things, like? Cause I remember back when I was a kid, like I would go to my friend Jess's house and I remember we'd always like hang out in his basement and watch like whatever Halloween movies or shows were on beforehand uh -huh. and like get really excited to go out and then after trick-or-treating I remember the best part was coming back home and then me and Brian would like Sweet organize our candy out and then we'd like <laughs> yeah sort it out <laughs> trade candy uh, trading candy afterwards was always a <laughs> high point then you'd eat it for like the next week or two <laughs> I remember one time, one of the houses gave me like a miniature loaf of Wonder Bread. Really? <laughs> like this big, yeah. I it think was pre-sealed, pre-packaged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I well. think one time I have got, I did get a toothbrush. <laughs> I think, I think, I can't remember if that's reality now or if it's just something that I thought would be funny that happens. That's, Getting a toothbrush for Halloween <laughs> is the most passive-aggressive yeah. thing I've ever heard. <laughs> one of my favorite costumes I had was like an assassin. I had like, it was basically a ninja mask or ninja outfit, but with a cape. Mm. But I was like, oh man, I'm so cool. <laughs> Do you remember that vest that had SWAT written on it? Oh yeah, that was yeah. mine. I remember that costume very specifically because I was like super excited to wear it. And obviously, you know, when it's Halloween, you want to like run from house to house. And that Halloween was like unnaturally warm. Mm. So I remember like by the end of it, I was like super sweaty. <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to leave this vest on, but it's so hot. <laughs> you know, I went to this one neighborhood one time and we go to this one woman's house. We don't know who it is, which is some random house. This woman comes to the door and she's holding a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. And clearly there's a Halloween party going on in the background. Me and my brother were like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh crap, I don't have any candy for you guys. Hold on, I'll be right back. She comes back with her wallet and she gives us each $5. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that created a memory that has lasted literally a lifetime. <laughs> oh man. I woke just as dusk broke. The early morning sun made the yellow maple leaves above glow warmly. All around camp, things were quiet and still. We all woke up, and as the sun rose higher, we talked about our nights. I didn't sleep nearly as well as last night, but it was still pretty good. I was definitely way warmer because I, I didn't even sleep with a jacket on. It was 100% like yeah, much more comfortable in terms of warmth, but I didn't get to sleep till like probably well after midnight. Oh, but, like I feel I still feel good right now. Yep, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I got this bamboo brush and it actually came a lot longer than this, but I chopped it off and carved it down and now it's my camping brush. <laughs> So my teeth are kind of grimy, so I'm going to go do that. <laughs> Eventually, we tore down camp, then headed off to the stream to fill up our water. It wasn't until after we filled our water that we realized we could have been making this a lot easier on ourselves for a long time now. I was getting the filter all ready and I saw this thing. This is for Nalgene's. You put it on top and then you put the hose on. But then this white thing didn't fit on there. And while we were filtering just now, I was looking at this and I was like, what is this for? Then I started to put my hose back on 
And I was like, this is for this. You can put the intake right here and nobody has to hold it. They can just put the platypus wow. right there. How long have we used this? <laughs> That's gotta make it like five times easier at least. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> I guess one of the reasons why we never realized this before is because we used to have different platypuses. So we had this filter before we ever got this type of platypus. So we just kept doing it the way we had done it before. Well, it does go to show that you're never too old or too smart to stop learning. <laughs> <laughs> You're always too stupid to keep learning. <laughs> so with nature calling, uh, many of you know I like to use natural toilet paper. I don't know why I didn't realize this immediately, but these magnolia leaves are gonna be perfect toilet paper. One, just because they're really big and have a lot of surface area, but also the underside of them is kind of like soft and fuzzy, so it's kind of like this nice like two-ply, lush, you know, Char Charmin Ultra. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'll report back on how that goes. <laughs> All right, well, I gotta say, that falls in probably the top five best natural toilet paper experiences I've had. Uh, it was just like using actual toilet paper. Now, we'll see if there's any irritant chemicals in the leaves I didn't anticipate. <laughs> and if there are, I'll have the narrator fill us in. <laughs> but so far, it gets the thumbs up. Thankfully, there were no irritants, and we were able to tidy up our campsite without a hitch. We now left camp, and Andrew found a particularly strange looking magnolia leaf. Look at this leaf. I'm like a Pikmin. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and ahead were more noteworthy plants. Okay, so one of the shrubs we keep seeing are these mountain laurels. They're kind of similar to the rhododendrons in that they have like waxy, shiny leaves. And we've seen these in other areas during the summer. And during that time, they have these really pretty, intricate looking flowers that are kind of like white and pink. There's also some eastern hemlock growing nearby, and this grows all over like the Appalachians, and you can make tea out of it. And this here is eastern white pine, and you can tell because each cluster of needles has like four to five needles in it, which is one of the characteristics. And of course you can make pine needle tea with it, which is sometimes good, sometimes kind of mild. <laughs> all around, there was also a fragrant sassafras plant, which can be used as a tea. There were also leaves belonging to a favorite tree of mine. Some of the leaves I keep seeing on the trail are these, which, you know, you know what this is, right? Maple? <laughs> it's a tulip poplar. <laughs> We've talked about it in the past, but it's a really great uh, tree for starting a fire. But one story associated with this is I remember on our first backpacking trip through Shenandoah, I kept seeing this leaf and it, they were like bright yellow on the ground. And I just remember it looking so weird and distinct because I hadn't seen this growing up a lot and it just has such a unique shape. And actually this is the tulip poplar that all these leaves came from. And one, the, the bark has a very kind of distinct cantaloupe texture, but also these are often some of the straightest tall trees to grow in the forest. Like they usually just go straight up like a pole. I know you could kind of say that about most trees, but like there are subtle differences that make it seem straighter than others. We continued retracing our steps, coming again to the small overlook we had passed by yesterday. Somehow, there seemed to be even more signs of autumn this morning as we hiked through the warm glow of the forest. And in some places, we found plants that were even reminiscent of the winter. So growing out of this stump is some wintergreen. I've been seeing it all along the trail, and there's some berries coming off of it. I've never actually had the wintergreen berries, but I'm really curious to try if this will taste minty. Hopefully it's ripe. <laughs> It tastes like if you had a really soggy, mushy apple right after eating some wintergreen gum. <laughs> I gotta try it now. <laughs> that was a super accurate description. Mm. But the, the wintergreen is nice. 
one more if you want to try. <laughs> one of us needs to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> we eventually returned to the large recessed cave that we had passed by yesterday and took another moment to appreciate its vegetation covered rocks. came back to the junction we had passed by yesterday. After a brief snack break, we continued on to a new trail. As we hiked, I saw some familiar saplings. I haven't seen a whole lot of this in this forest, or any at all really, but there's a small patch of pawpaw saplings just coming up here. And you can tell because of the way it is. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> of course, a lot of these are still too small to bear fruit, but perhaps one day they will grow into a mighty pawpaw tree. So there's no pawpaws up tall already? Not that I see. Is that one? No, that's magnolia. It's confusing because there are some other trees that have sort of similarly shaped leaves, like magnolia or hickory, um, and from afar it can look like pawpaw, but yeah, I don't see any tall ones. Later, we saw some sort of bright object through the trees. I thought this was like a big van in the distance or something. Is it the, the farm of John Lutton's farm? I believe so. Is there a family of farmers to feed us breakfast? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we would come to the John Lytton farm. It was here that a log cabin was originally built by John Lytton in the late 1800s. The land was purchased in 1946 by the Slavin family and inhabited until 1979, when it was purchased by the Park Service. That's funny they put like wallpaper for the brick. Oh, that is weird. It was really beautiful actually. That's a nice, nice little barn. Anything down there? Uh, you know. Not too much. Foundation looks a little shaky though. Yeah. There's a hidey hole down there. Hiding area. Huh, whoa. Definitely would be really scary to find this in the middle of the night. <laughs> like, you needed shelter really badly. You'd be like, mm, no. <laughs> Nearby was a serene pond. And up ahead, some horses were hitched up near another historic building. Inside the building were old rusted tools and machinery. Cool. Wow. This one looks like some sort of... Oh, look, it's nasty. Yeah. yeah, this has to be a plow, right? You sit on the back. So. Some sort of... I see, like, back in the day, like... <laughs> <laughs> I could just see, like, back in the day something like cozy about this. <laughs> yeah. The master bedroom. <laughs> I just curl up in this dugout hole here. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you get to the second floor? I'm gonna stay on top of the cross beams. The cross beams, yeah. I was gonna say, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> Ooh. Definitely a bit creaky. The roof actually looks fairly new. Yeah, they must do that to protect the wood. Yeah. Yeah, I can feel the floorboards moving. Yeah. Right, I'm going down. All right. 
After exploring the building, some friendly horse riders told us about another historic site we should check out. Have you guys ever seen up the cliff here? Okay, so the dude down there said that there's corrals up here where they would keep the animals to keep them cool under this rock up here. So we're gonna go check it out. Whoa! Wow. Wow, that is so cool. This is really cool. I do feel cooler. It's even like built to the angle of the rocks, you know? Oh, yeah. Man, if I was a climber, I'm not even a climber and I really want to start going. Between the history of the corrals and the impressive sight of the cliffs, we were happy to have been told about this little secret. There's a room back here. Like you could put a human back here. We need to cool a human off, you put them over here. Put the animals over there. Yeah, maybe they stored equipment there or something. It is significantly cooler. Yeah. Under these rocks. Yeah. It's really nice. Now we headed back down the trail to revisit the first farmhouse. So we didn't realize you could actually go in this building, but some friendly people told us that you could. So <laughs> we're gonna check it out. And they said it was actually really cool inside. So Hot dogs windows. and soft serve inside. <laughs> oh wait, wait by this window. Okay. Welcome. Whoa! Oh, whoa. The inside was worn down, but you could still see signs of life from the mid 1900s. Oh, look. There's linoleum in this kitchen area. Huh. Wow. They said this was the last family to move out of the area, and they moved out in the 50s. So that makes sense, there would be linoleum and stuff. They said that they made their living getting chestnuts and stuff from the trees. I do like chestnuts. That is, that is a top tier nut. <laughs> uh, I just get this weird feeling, like a really cozy feeling being in here. I think it goes up like this, uh, and then there was a little loft. Mm. There's a shoe. They said there was writing on the wall. You see any writings on the wall? Looks like there's a old newspaper or something here. Oh yeah. It's kind of layered. Oh, there's a crossword right here. It says wild something. Calling all girls ballet club. Cheery modern breakfast nook, $69. Look, there's like a diamond ring or something there. It's like slack suit, $14.98. Wow, this is like the front page, something about uh, Churchill. It's weird how like people who lived here back then experience reality the same way we do. Like we always think of the 50s or any past era as like being in sepia tone. Or, yeah. But it's just like they saw basically this with real human eyeballs. <laughs> now we left the historic farmstead and made our way through the meadow. John Litton and his wife V lived with four kids in that little house, which is hard to imagine. They not only subsistence farm, they also forage things like pawpaws and persimmons and you know wild blackberries and stuff like that. It's really cool to think about how some of the plants that I've learned over the time were used historically by people who were just trying to get by. When we think of people in different times or different cultures, Sometimes it's easy to think their lives and interests are wildly different than ours. And in a lot of ways, that's true. We all have our own individual quirks, and that's what makes the world so vast and interesting to explore. But 
we also have so much in common. If you look at different cultures across time and space, there are some fundamental similarities. It's important to strive to become a unique individual, or to have pride in the different places where we're from. But it's when we share these things with others and find what we have in common that those differences can truly be appreciated. <sighs> End of the journey. It's funny, earlier we were at the farm and there were some like old timers telling us about <laughs> I hope they don't mind being called that. <laughs> but telling us about the history of the farm and it's just funny, it's like everywhere you go you meet people like that who are just super interested in a certain location and super willing to share about it. It's one of the great joys to run up to somebody and they just start telling you about the place. Like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you're slightly more knowledgeable than you were before. <laughs> We've had that experience everywhere we go, like whether it's in Germany with Jakin or in China with like our, our relatives. Everyone's so much more similar than we think. When people know each other, everybody's the same. People only seem different when you don't know them. And when you get to know them, you're like, oh, you're just like me. Who doesn't want to ride on a horse through the hills drinking Coors or, <laughs> or sake or tea or whatever your drink of choice is? <laughs> Good times. Big South Fork was a unique landscape with a fascinating history, and we're glad we all got to share in everything that this place had to offer. Okay, so it's just roads from here on out. We've got a gravel road, and then there should be a main road up ahead, but we'll see. And if there is a main road, then one of us is gonna go back and get the car so the others don't have to walk. Okay, we decided to do this all walk. It's not that far and we're not 100% sure you'll be able to get a car in here. You probably can, but. Okay, we changed our mind already. I'm gonna go. I'll see you guys in a bit. <laughs> That's where we started the other day. Back this way, it's towards the car. Campground is deserted. It was so lively on the way in. There was volleyball going on, campers everywhere. Feels weird. Okay, car is just up ahead. All right, let's go get the guys. Thank you for letting us no, be here. Yeah. Thanks for the beer. Do you have the keys? Oh, I'm the drive. <laughs> Sorry. Robbie's lost all logic in his head. <laughs> did I tell you we uh, we took the boys camping? Where did, where'd you go? We took them to Hocking, uh, Hills. Hocking Hills. Oh yeah. Well, we did that. The same place I, I took you guys like yeah. years and years ago. <laughs> well, here's the question I have is because you taking us to Hocking Hills got this all started, but did you take him 
Talking Hills. I did. No. No. Yes. I remember you showed pictures of Hawking Hills, and I was like, no, Wait, I, you went camping? Yeah. You went I remember it was when we were dating, and that was like when I was like, oh, okay, this might be serious because like it was the first girl I'd ever been with that wanted to go hiking or mm. that sort of thing. <laughs> Oh wait, so what I was gonna say though is so technically you started Adventure Archives then. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right. What? We've, it's, we've been through that. 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 We've been well, we jump from there. <laughs> I'm scaling down, but not, you know. Oh, this is one of my favorite kinds. Just yeah. telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Mary Sin Cabbage. Colonel Lesbird. It's been years. Dashing as ever, I see. I'm sorry Aquiasara couldn't make it today, but who are your three handsome escorts here? I'm afraid neither three speak a word of English. They're friends of mine from China. This is a wonderful stuntman, Jay Ramundo, a talented cameraman, Richard Frangiamore, and his assistant, Paisan Amiko. Xinxiangmeng, this is my friend, Les Bird. Ni hao. Do you speak English? No, I'm not sure. I've been learning for 10 years. 我们障碍的明星的朋友们，您将受到我的保护。谢谢 ，Ramundo， 我说对了吗？呃，是，对 ，R a m u n d o 请给我说一次 ，Ramundo， 对不起，再来一次 ，Ramundo， 再一次 ，Ramundo， 请你再说一遍你的名字 ，Richard Frangiamore， 再来。Frangiamore， 我听不到你的声音，再说一遍。Frangiamore，Frangiamore， 你呢？拜山的米克，什么？拜山的米克，太好了，非常好。Richard would also like to give a shout out to his wife Erica and to remind everyone to stop and enjoy the little things in life. Oh, hey Wilson. Hey Jason Bourgeois, how you doing over there? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm just looking at the new Expedition Research LLC portable grill. Uh, Anne McBride and Salvador Gonzalez gave it to me. Ah, I see that. The Expedition. Oh, no, I got the San Juan one. Oh. See, the San Juan one's where it's at. It's basically like you're cooking over a, cooking over a fire there. You prefer uh, fire to propane, do you? Oh, you know, like my buddy Dan Vulcan says, and like my buddy John Muir says, between every two pines, there's a gateway to nature, you know? <gasps> On behalf of everybody at the Adventure Archives crew, I'd like to formally apologize to all fans of Tim Allen's Home Improvement, which I, until now, thought was called Tool Time. <gasps> Jesper Caparoto, we're detecting activity from Jung Moo Kim. What should we do? Hack into the GPS satellites to triangulate his position, get his exact coordinates. Understood. I'll have to start by hacking into his database. See if I can get his password. Looks like he's trying to fight back on me. Looks like Jung Moo's been in contact with a lot of people. From Gavin Ryan, to Crystal Door, and to John Scott. We've even got Elaine R. Anthony on here. But we can triangulate his position and figure out exactly where he is. It looks like the last person Jung Moo spoke to was a man named Gavin Ryan. Jung Moo sent this message to him. The message reads, Shout out to Kelly for being my hiking buddy and wonderful, inspiring wife. We've got you now, Jung Moo Kim. Aaron Jones, hello. Ah, Sun Jian Huang. Have you read the works of the Westerner Henry David Thoreau? I often translate them and share them with my best friend, Emily. If you ever find a quiet place, you should read his writings. Even a samurai warrior needs to reflect on the world around him once in a while. Having a calm mind will help me to defeat the Mongols. Thank you. Nothing is so attractive and unceasingly curious as character.
There is no plant that needs such tender treatment. There is none that will endure so rough. It is the violet and the oak. The Mongols are on the defensive. We must strike now and end this war before they can regroup tomorrow. You sent our men to die. Jim Potts, Charlie Joe, John Truitt, they are soldiers. They will die proud in combat. And their blood is on your hands, Lin Chen. There is another way. Let me sneak in, poison the army, an act of terrorism. We must face them with honor. If you continue down the path of the ghost, you will be no better than the Mongols. Need to buy my Jin Sakai mask soon. <laughs> <laughs> I logged on to Amazon and I saw, recently looked at, and it was like a samurai mask. <laughs>